Welcome to our podcast of this week's teaching from Ephraim's Light Assembly. This is Pastor Frank Smith, Senior Pastor. We are glad that you're listening to this teaching from our house of study. I want to welcome those who attend Ephraim's Light Assembly and those who will be listening to the podcast of today's message. Before we begin with this week's teaching, taken from Numbers chapter 16, verse 1, to Numbers chapter 18, verse 22, I want to take a minute and say a couple of things. We always want you to read the scripture lesson prior to listening to the teaching. It gives you a greater understanding of the content. Our goal in this teaching ministry is for you to have a better, more peaceful life by living God's way. We do our best to put our opinions aside and let God's word speak directly to you. This is why there are so many scriptures in these teachings. It is recorded in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, that Yeshua said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now to everyone listening, we love you and appreciate you and we pray for you. We know that if you will abide by God's commandments, you will be blessed. That's his promise. Every day we have a choice. We can either follow God's way or man's way. We pray you will choose God's way. If you will, his promise is that you will be given power from him to overcome all evil. Now let's get into today's message from the book of Numbers. It's called The Seeds of Rebellion. All right, we want to welcome everybody tonight. Hallelujah. Seeds of Rebellion. Parashal Karak, number 16, 1 through numbers 18, verse 32. It's a story of jealousy and a struggle for power. It involves a man named Korah, a Levite, who wanted to oust from power Israel's high priest, Aaron, and Israel's leader, Moses. The man that started it all was Korah. He was wealthy, he was clever, he was astute. He was a great-grandson of Levi and the third of Jacob's 12 sons. That made him a first cousin to Moses and Aaron. Now, Korah was born in Egypt. He'd seen all the miracles of God that had taken place during Israel's deliverance from Egyptian bondage. And as a Levite, Korah served in the tabernacle. Now, remember... All Levites were to serve in the tabernacle, but only the sons of Aaron could be priests. Korah, therefore, could not become a priest, yet he was jealous of the fact that Aaron had been chosen as high priest of Israel. In addition, this guy had other problems. In addition, Korah's cousin, Elitzaphon, had been chosen as leader of Korah's family, the Levite family of Kahat. Korah had felt that he should lead the family, so in addition to the animosity he had towards Moses and Aaron, he was troubled because he was not chosen to be the head of the family's line, and he couldn't be a priest. So these grievances, folks, led Korah to enlist two people named Dathan and Abram well-known troublemakers in Israel nation to participate in ousting Moses and Aaron. So together, these men recruited 250 community leaders who sympathized with them. Then they came to confront Moses and Aaron. What was their claim? Their claim was that Moses had appointed Aaron as high priest without permission from God. Now we know that not to be true from the scripture, but That's what they were laying on me, false claims. They developed a plan to get themselves appointed to the position of high priest. This was a plan of rebellion. First, they would try diplomacy laced with a little blackmail, and if that didn't work, they'd try a stronger approach. A lesson to be learned. Do not covet. Exodus 20, 15, you know that's in the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. 
don't look at something others have been given and covet their title or their responsibilities or anything they have. Doing so can start a rebellion, which is what happened with Korah and his cohorts. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Concentrate on your own purpose, your own assignment. It's important that we all understand what causes rebellion against God. Let's look at some. Rebellion didn't start here on earth. It started in God's realm with the archangel Hasatan. God, being aware of Hasatan's war against him, warned the newly created couple of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He warned that consuming the knowledge of evil would lead to death. This is a Torah principle. Let me explain. We know from Genesis 3, verses 8 through 10, you can write it down, read it when you get home, that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden and that he warned them not to learn of evil. In this prohibition, God was giving them instructions on how to live, how to be blessed on the earth. In other words, God was giving them his wisdom, the wisdom with which he created the world and manages it. The wisdom he gave Adam and Eve was passed on, not only by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but Noah also. How do we know that? The Torah itself clearly writes that God instructed Noah to take into the ark animals that were ritually pure, which means that Noah knew about clean and unclean, which is a major principle in the Torah. We also know that Jacob, right after his dream called Jacob's Ladder, spent some time studying the Torah under Melchizedek, who was Shem, Noah's son, the high priest of Salem, which eventually Salem became Jerusalem. So the point is, God's Torah, his teaching and instruction, was known to man since the Garden of Eden. Wasn't something new. All this led to the Mount Sinai experience where Moses and the Israelites received the wisdom of God in the official form of the commandments. We know that Moses made eight trips, eight trips up Mount Sinai to meet with God to receive the Ten Commandments and a full armament of commandments on how to keep the Ten. <clears throat> so there are 613 commandments in all. They tell you how to obey the Ten. So the Torah was legally presented to Israel and the mixed multitude that left Egypt with them. Moses wrote all this down in the first five books of the Bible we call the Torah, which comes from the Hebrew word horah, which means direction and teaching. It was later translated from Hebrew to Greek as law. Through Moses' meetings with God on the mountain, he was able to see the Torah with perfect, crystal clear vision. God's instructions provided for only one high priest of Israel, and God had chosen Aaron for that service. So now as we study Korah's rebellion, we're going to see a model develop that always happens when we follow our own humanness instead of the principles of God. What started Korah on the road to rebellion? The answer is he was focused on himself. Before the fall, man was created in the image of God. Since God is a spirit with no physical image, we know that Adam and Eve were beams of light. Therefore, being in the image of God means to be like him in character. What does Scripture say about his character? It's simple. God is love. Say it, folks. God is love. Love is the adoration of another, a desire to be near them, and a desire to care for them. Therefore, if we're more concerned about others than ourselves, we're becoming more like God. If we are self-centered, we're moving away from God. On display in the life of Korah is that his self-focus was the root of his bitterness. He was being a reactionary. 
lesson. Self is not our true identity. That is not the image we were created in. God in us is our true identity, and God is love. Our example, of course, is Yeshua. When he was being accused and convicted of a non-crime, he did not defend himself. Why? Because there was no self in him. Lashon Hara, folks, we've been over and over Lashon Hara. It's speaking ill of someone, whether it's true or whether it's not. Whenever people are accusing others, they're destroying them with their speech. It's murder by tongue. Since we are supposed to be loving one another and building each other up, that kind of bitterness cannot be part of our lives. When we live in the Spirit, we know that whatever people are doing to us, they're doing to God because it is His Spirit that lives in us. Therefore, their criticism of, of us is generic of the absence of a relationship with God. 1 Corinthians six seventeen. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Let no wholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. 1 Corinthians six seventeen. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. A lesson to learn. The Spirit of the Lord is represented as so interpenetrating and energizing to the spirit of the believer that the two become one. That's our mission. Become one with God. If we ever hope to be in His kingdom, we need to become one with Him. Lucifer was separated from God when he began to desire worship for himself, he wanted a higher position for himself, which led to his rebellion against God. Another lesson to learn. When we live in the Spirit of God, no one can do anything to us because we have put all of our trust in Christ so that our will no longer exists, but it is Christ who lives in us. Colossians 3, verse 11. In Christ you are all sons of God through your trust in Him. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no fe female or male. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. Self-focus leads to jealousy, and jealousy leads to rebellion, and rebellion leads to conspiring with others. We always want to talk to others about what's going on. Gossip, that kind of thing. It's the old herd mentality that draws in more people as it rolls along. Thoughts of discontentment or being jealous of what others have or their position in life must be taken captive and brought into the selfless obedience of Christ because when rebellion manifests, it leads to a secondary set of problems, hate and fear. We see this in the Palestinians in our present day. They are jealous of God choosing the Israelites as his chosen people and jealous of the land that God gave them. They want the citizens of Israel destroyed. Jealousy, folks, is the root of anti-Semitism. <clears throat> In our own country, the religious community has been anti-Semitic since the 300s A.D., and that's why people believe the church has replaced Israel as God's chosen people. God said not to fail to assemble for the purpose of teaching His Torah to the world. However, instead of realizing that following the Jewish Jesus means testifying of him and living in a living, I should say, in obedience to God's commandments, religion, like Korah, has rebelled against God and established its own theories and doctrines. <clears throat> you know, it's amazing to me 
that we got churches on every corner throughout this nation, and yet we are a pagan nation. Well, is all those churches out there never stopped the paganism. It continued to grow. Why is that? Because they're party zones. They go to church for the show, not for the teaching. Religion is a false god that takes on the appearance but not the lifestyle of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is man wanting to be God just like Korah wanted to be a high priest. The Christian religion was born in the 300s AD when men became, when they began, I should say, when men began to come up with their own theories and their own doctrines. Man's religion has changed God's commanded Sabbath from Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown to Sunday, the day of the sun god. Passover was changed to Easter, which became, I'm sorry, Passover was changed to Easter, which began 2,000 years before Christ as a pagan Babylonian holiday celebrating the beginning of spring. It began as a gala celebration honoring the resurrection of the god Tammuz, who was killed by a wild boar and became the deity of spring vegetation and protector from wild beasts. In Ezekiel 8, verse 14, we see the women weeping for Tammuz at the gate of the temple. Later in ancient Mesopotamia, around 500 B.C., it became a celebration honoring Ishtar, the goddess of love, sensuality, fertility, and war. This goddess took on different names in different regions. In Greece, she was Astarte. To the Israelites, she was known as Asteroid. Our Christian celebration, very similar. It originated when Samarius erected a tree at the grave of Tammuz, the sun god, and she decorated it. The celebration gathered steam when the Germans brought to America the character of St. Nicholas, also known as Bell Snickel, Niglo, and Pell's Nickel, a legend that dates back to 245 A.D. See, all the trouble started 245 to 300. Yom Kippur and Sukkot, the ordained feast days of God, were forgotten. In short, religion, working hand in hand with the men of the world, left the appointed times of God. In other words, God, we don't care what you want. We're going to be religious. We're going to do it our way. Learn this lesson. Live in the present moment and be content. Trusting God, observing His commandments, His Sabbath, and seven ordained feast days. Korah and his group were cunning. They were very cunning. When they approached Moses saying that they were concerned about him taking on too much. Hey Moses, old buddy, you're working too hard. We suggest that you and Aaron should kind of step aside and appoint us as priests to help out. Wow. In sheep's clothing, right? A lesson to learn. Korah and his sidekicks were slandering Moses and Aaron with cunning words. And this is how a conspiracy usually begins. Wherever there is division and discontent, like in America today, the nation is split, you can apply this model that we're studying tonight. This is what happens when a person or a group of people or a nation no longer puts in trust in God. Our nation and our country's motto is, In God We Trust. But we've come to a point that people are so misled and ignorant about God that they deny Him. But neither do they live in harmony with His commandments. Yes, they don't completely deny Him, but not living by His commandments and living in harmony with them, that is denying Him. Satan is the great accuser, and his spirit is always on the job looking for those who do not know God and are struggling with confusion, fear, anger, and discontentment. Remember, Satan's walking around the earth seeking those whom he can devour. And if they're not educated in the Torah, they're easy targets. 
lesson. It takes constant exposure to God's Word and the study of His commandments to maintain a lifestyle that honors Him. What did Moses do when Korah and company came to accuse him? He prostrated himself in humility and he got low to the ground and he cried out to God, What's the answer, Lord? Rather than committing Lashon Hurrah, which would have been an improper response, Moses, knowing his relationship with God, solid relationship, told Korah that the next day, Korah, God's going to show you who was holy and who is allowed to approach him. A lesson to learn. We are to be conduits of whatever God has given us and let it flow through to others. Moses' wise response was merciful because it gave Korah and his friends a chance to repent. They didn't take it. And by refusing to respond, they separated themselves from God. We were talking about that earlier as we discussed a little bit. And that is, God cannot bless sin. He cannot bless America right now because we are so immoral, it's unbelievable. He can't bless us. As for those being slandered, we can learn from the sheep herders. They train their sheep to know their voice. Remember Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And when threatened by a predator, they call to them and gather in a tight bunch where the predatory animal can't single them out. It's this way they are protected. And that's what I'm trying to tell people as I invite them to come down and learn. I said, this is a school. You're going to learn things. And what you're going to learn is to get into the kingdom of God, stay together, stay focused. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And if he speaks and tells you to get out of the way, you better get out of the way. As for those being slandered, we can learn from those sheep herders. The lesson, the more we agree with God's instructions, the closer we'll be to each other and to our shepherd who protects us by the word of the Lord. What am I describing here? It's the body of Christ. Say it, the body of Christ. So this week's lesson teaches us that self I'm sorry, self-desire leads to rebellion against God and the use of cunning words to get our way. When we denigrate others with accusations, it leads to division, it leads to hate. Division scatters God's people so that alone the enemy's free to pick them off one by one. So what happens when you're accused and you get angry at somebody else? You don't speak to them, you break up. And that person may have benefited from your teaching. It may have benefited from God's wisdom flowing through you like a conduit. Folks, this is a serious issue. Korah's love of himself represents all those people who rebel against the will of God and stubbornly refuse to confront their own issues. Numbers 6 verse 12, And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abram and sons of Elab, but they said defiantly, we will not come up. What happens when we invite people to church? They say, well, I ain't got time. I'm busy. Korah then ramped up his attack, alleging that Egypt, from which God had rescued them, that was the land of milk and honey. Gee, did he flip something there? They left. They cried out to the Lord for years. Deliver us, deliver us. And now... This bird is saying that was a land of milk and honey. He says, Moses, you wrongfully took us out of it. That wasn't God's will. A Korah accused Moses and mocked God by reversing the truth about Canaan. Today, what happens? The world calls its ways the land of milk and honey. You listen to that lying bunch of Democrats and they'll tell you, Crime is down, employment's up, country's never been better. That's a mockery of God's Torah, the constitution of the kingdom of God. That's what Korah did, and that's what's being done today in America. Somebody say amen. amen. No matter what Moses said, Korah and his friends became more resolute in their rebellion. They just dig in. 
It's going to happen in the last days, folks. A rebellious people will run into the rocks and defiantly cry out, cry out for the mountains to fall on them rather than turn back to God's way of living. Find that in Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And he said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. This is the God that says, I'm not willing that any should perish. This is the God, folks, that loves his creation. Yet they make him a villain. Even in the face of the great tribulation and rebellious, those rebellious people will dig in and they'll raise their slander to a new level. 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 5. But understand this. That in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Young people, listen to that. Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not having good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of listen to this now, the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And what does it say after that? Avoid such people. Korah and his group added to their grievances Moses' failure to give them a land of lust pastures and homes for them when the real reason, the real reason was Israel's refusal to trust God and obey his commandments. It was for these reasons that Israel had to wait 38 years to go into the promised land. Take another lap around the mountain. Take another lap around the mountain. You ain't learned nothing yet. If they had been faithful, they would have gone into the land by the second year after they left Egypt. Lesson, our hardness of heart can delay blessings that God has for us. Moses went to the Lord. And he requested, Lord, don't receive their grain offering. What was he talking about? Where do we see God refusing an offering? He refused Cain's offering because Cain offered him what? Second best. That's right. As for Korah and company, they were not living according to the commandments of God that they agreed to at Mount Sinai. Remember, the mixed multitude, all of Israel was standing there and said, Moses... We can't stand the voice of God. You talk to him. Whatever you agree on, we agree. We'll do it. So Moses said to Korah in number 16, verse 16 and 17, Tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they as well as Aaron. Let each take Aaron's censer and put incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 censers both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So the next day, Korah, Dathan, Abram, together with 250 sympathizers drafted from the various tribes of Israel, they all gathered at the door of the tabernacle in the presence of all of Israel. So everybody showed up. I think somebody heard there's going to be a showdown. God was there and he spoke to Moses and Aaron some very disturbing words. Number 16, 20 through 21. He said, Moses, Aaron, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Now those who love the Lord and obey His commandments today are called out of the world and its systematic progressive religion. Revelation 18, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Folks, this country is headed for Islam. We are away from God, going that way as fast as we can. A lesson to be learned. God is calling those who love Him, 
out of the false Babylonian system of the world. If we continue living like them, we will receive the same plagues as will befall them. And I don't think it's going to be that far off. Numbers 19, 22 through 24. Then they, Moses and Aaron, fell on their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the congregation, Moses, and tell them, Get away from the tents of Korah, Datham, and Abram. Moses instructed the people, Get away from those tents of those wicked men and have nothing to do with their rebellion against God. Get away from anyone who denies the Sabbath and God's feast days and His instructions in the Torah. Stand alone if you have to, but don't engage in their rebellion against God. God is moving, folks, in these last days. Trust Him and do not have anything to do with the ones who criticize God's Word or the teachers of the Torah. If they want to badmouth the teachers of the Torah, I don't want to listen to that guy. Get away from them. Psalm 105, verse 15. Do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. Moses gave a speech to gathered Israel, and he said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. Back in Numbers 12, verse 3, we learn that Moses was very meek above all the men of the earth, which were on the face of this earth, he was meek. It said in Scripture that Moses was the most humble man on earth. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, it says that Yeshua, like Moses, was meek and lowly in heart. That's the sign of somebody who loves Christ. In Hebrew, it means that Moses denied himself and bowed down in his mind, which is spiritually, not following his own agenda, but obeying the will of God. In this way, Moses was a type and shadow of Yeshua. You know, we all struggle with things. But when we make up our mind and make it up in our heart and say, you know, I'm just not going to do that, God will step in and give you the power. As such, Moses said to Israel, if these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and he swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. As Moses finished speaking these words, what happened? The earth opened and swallowed Korah, Dathan, Abram, all their belongings and their family, and the congregation fled in fear. Ah, seek hole. Then fire came out from the holy place in the tabernacle and killed the 250 sympathizers of Korah. Can you imagine? Lesson to be learned. 2 Peter 3, 9 says it best. It is God that is not willing that any should perish. Because in John 10, 10, he said, It is Satan who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It was Korah's rebellion against God that was responsible for their demise. Now, this is a major point with Christianity today. Christianity still believes that God is good and bad. He is not. God is good. He's the only good thing. Our Creator. The bad comes from who? Satan. Satan. Amen. 1 John 1, 5. God is light. In Him there is not darkness at all. Those who had the darkness of Korah's rebellion in their hearts disappeared. Listen to this. They disappeared in the light which came out of the holy place in the tabernacle. God is light. The light swallowed the darkness. Darkness cannot coexist with light. In the beginning, 
God said, let the darkness and the light be separated. That's the reason he made day and night. And this is why God in his great mercy is sending Yeshua back for a thousand years to do what? Rewrite the Torah on our hearts so that by the end of the millennium, sin and death can be destroyed forever and there will be no more darkness in our minds and our hearts and we can live in the sight of God in holiness unless our light is in harmony with His light, we'll perish. I think that's something to get excited about. What do you think? Love must have subjects. Listen to this now. This is important. Love must have subjects on which to lavish its affections. That's real love. That's God. This is why it's recorded in Genesis that God said, let there be light. You see, God was alone in the universe, but the light coming out of him could not help but give life to others. That's why he created man. Therefore, the love of God is the light of God, and the light of God maintains the universe. If God's light went out, the universe would disappear. He'd go back into darkness. Now, this is why Moses' face shone like the sun, radiating with the reflective light of God. And this is why it says in Revelation, there will be no need for the sun in New Jerusalem, because the Lamb of God and all the people of God that are in concert with the Lamb of God, they're going to be the light. All darkness, somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. All darkness will be gone. If anyone's light begins to dim, the light from the others will recharge them. That's what it says in the New Testament when it says to build each other up. Feed on each other's light. If somebody's light gets dim, put your light on them. Build them up. That's the way God wants us to operate. Darkness will be eliminated as well as death, hell, and the grave. Boy, I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. Darkness will be judged into non-existence. And only those who are the light of the Lord will remain. Okay. Woo! I mean, that's, that's overwhelming. This is why the New Testament talks about being crucified with Christ. It means to die to the false self and return to the way that God created us. We'll live as beams of light as Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden before the fall. Light is the Hebrew or, O-R, and it appears in the word Torah, T O R. A-H. The mixture of good and evil cannot stand, it won't stand, because they can't go exist any more than you can have darkness and light at the same time. Adam and Eve, who have been beams of light, found themselves naked without the light. They looked around, oh, Eve, I think my light went out. <laughs> when they disobeyed God, they found themselves in darkness. Their light went out. They had to be clothed with skin. And I could, I could teach for an hour on this, but the skin is also called or, O-R, the same thing as light in the Hebrew. So the eternal light from Adam and Eve, their eternal light went out. God had to clothe them with skin which is temporary light till we can get our eternal light back isn't that so do you understand it a little better now our fleshly existence is temporary leave the darkness and return to the frequency of god which is light return to the spiritual which is being in harmony with him I don't know about you, but that just convinces me I got to get better. I got to be in harmony with God. I want my eternal light, this old light, this flesh, it's going to go out. Amen. I want that eternal light. Did Israel learn anything from the amazing experience of seeing the earth swallow Korah, Dathan, and Abram, their belongings, and their families? 
Were they impressed that the glory of God put out the darkness of the 250 sympathizers with Korah? Sadly, no. Listen to Numbers chapter 16, verses 41 through 43. On the next day, the very next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, You killed the people of the Lord. They blaming it on... Mo I mean, what do they think? Moses could wave his wand and open up a sinkhole? <laughs> you killed the people of the Lord. Now it happened, the Scripture said, when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron, that they turned toward the tabernacle of the meeting, and suddenly the cloud, guess who the cloud is? The cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the meeting. Can you imagine? The very next day Israel began to complain again. What a bunch of complainers. They blamed Moses for the demise of the wicked. They learned nothing from all the drama on display before them. And this goes to show that the sin of murmuring and complaining, oh, let me never do that, has deep roots and it's so hard to separate from our lives. And that's true, it is. People can change their outward appearance and still have murmuring going on in their heart. Change must take place in our heart for there to be a real revival from sin. That's what we were talking about earlier. America is not going to change until all the darkness that we've created engulfs us and somebody gets hurt and it's going to happen. Sean Hannity says, I pray it won't. Well, he knows it will. And it is. It's going to happen. The darkness that this country has moved into is going to destroy some people. Their attitude royally offended God, who said in verse 44 and 45, Scripture says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. Again, Moses, every time Moses hears God say something like that, Moses said, Oh, let me get on my face. Quick, let me, let me hit the floor. Oh, Moses fell on his face before the Lord in intercession for the people. It seems Moses was falling on his face before the Lord in intercession a whole lot. Luke 6, 28, Love your enemies, but to those of you who will listen, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Romans 12, verses 17 through 21, do not repay anyone for evil. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't get even. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. This is what God has called you to do, and He will grant you His blessing. Wow. Do you think we can do that? Yeah. We got to. That's right. Deuteronomy 32 verse 35 says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and recompense. Our job is to exemplify the Father's un unconditional love. Of the wicked, God has declared this. Remember this, folks. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. It's coming at them. Darkness, destruction is coming at those who absolutely refuse to come and hear and learn and obey the Word of God. The people had given Satan, the purveyor of death, the green light by their thoughts and actions, and Moses was trying to stop the cause and effect of their sin. What's the lesson? Don't partner with Satan by committing Lashon hurrah. Bless those who've got problems. Bless those who do you wrong. Give them a blessing. Pray for them. If you don't commit Lashon hurrah, 
you'll be blessed. If you do, it'll remove you from God's covering. Despite Moses' actions, a plague had already begun. And I'll tell you tonight, it's already begun in America. It's already underway. They're terror cells right now, getting warmed up. There are enemies overseas watching a uh, nursing home president that can't even walk off a stage correctly and can't even put together two sentences. They're watching all this, and the darkness, the destruction is already underway, just like it is right here. Despite Moses' actions, a plague had already begun. Moses put in the incense and made atonement for the people standing there between the dead and the living. Moses stood between death and the living. So the plague was stopped, but not until how many people? 14,700 people. 750 people, 14,750, lay dead in addition to Korah, Abraham, and the 250 others. Lesson. God is moving in these last days. He is pleading with people to return to the Torah so that they'll be ready to be regathered to Israel and reunited with Judah. That calls out there, and it's out there for everybody. For those who will dig into Scripture, knowledge will increase, and through Christ, they will see the character of God more clearly than ever before. For those being gathered to the Lord, it is necessary that we have knowledge of God's character, because if we are to be changed into His image, we must know Him intimately. Amen. That's the reason we're here studying. We're learning what God's character is all about. How are we going to be like Him if we don't know His character? And I submit to you today, and I'm not being critical, but folks haven't been taught the character of God. Some of them out there still think that God does bad things to people. That's the reason they say the Old Testament's done away with. And it's a lie to keep them from learning about the character of God. America's going to get more and more Islamic. Why is that? Because the Islamic God is what? This is what happened to Islam. They see God as a wrathful, punishing, harsh, judgmental God who kills the infidels who do evil. So they act as they imagine their false God acts. What do they do? They torture and they kill. When we get the supernatural revelation of the character of Yeshua, our eyes are open and we receive a double, double portion of manna. Yeshua said, I am that manna. He is the manna, folks, that only falls on the sixth day. What are we in right now? The sixth day. He is the double portion blessing on the final generation that will be carried into the millennial reign, the millennial Shabbat, with Him as their teacher. we got to have a heart for leaving the ways of the world and living by the commandments of God. We heard somebody today preaching that... An, that America has become a nation of Moabites. You want to know a bite? You know what a Noabite is? Moabite, excuse me. You know what that is? It's no longer walking with God. That's a Moabite. We become a pagan nation. The reward of heaven or the fear of hell will only temporarily change people and then we'll go right back to the flesh the temporary light. But His love conquers all. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, there we find that God never forces Himself on anyone, but the results of following Satan should be sufficient warning to send us back into the direction of our God of love. That's the reason that darkness and destruction are coming to this country, and it's going to wake up a few people and this place is going to be completely full. We may have to set up monitors in the parking lot. 
lesson. In our lesson today, self-exaltation started with Korah and it spread to the 250. This allowed Satan to send a plague that spread through the entire nation of Israel. I don't know how many people were there, probably what, 6 million? And it killed just under 15,000 people. All of this happened in just a couple of days. Now, we all had a fit, and everybody ran to church on 9-11. How many people were killed in 9-11? 4,000? 4, 4,000? 4, 5,000? 15,000 people in Israel died as a result of the plague. Satan can only take those who have wrong principles, those who align themselves with him, no matter how much pleasure Satan promises, his domain is death. Satan has this radical, liberal idea that he can destroy God by destroying his children. That's just about as smart as the Democrats thinking they can spend their way out of debt. Amen. Ain't going to happen. Number 17, verse 1. Adonai had Moses speak to the children of Israel and have them bring a staff from the leader of each ancestral tribe, 12 staffs. Write each man's name on his staff and write Aaron's name on the staff of Levi. For each tribe's leader is to have one staff. Now, where have we seen this before? Ezekiel chapter 37, where God said, Ezekiel, take two sticks, write Ephraim on one, write Jude on the other, and put them together in your hand because that's what I'm going to do. One representing Judah and Benjamin and the southern tribes of Israel and the other stick marked Joseph for Ephraim and the lost ten tribes of Israel still scattered in the nations today. He instructed Ezekiel to put them together because that's what God is going to do. He's going to resurrect the whole house of Israel. God instructed Moses to put the staffs from the leaders of each tribe into the tabernacle of meeting in front of the Ark of the Testimony. And he said in verse 5, And it shall be that the rod of the man whom I choose will blossom. Thus I will rid myself of the complaints of the children of Israel, which they make against you. In other words, Korah accused Moses and Aaron of being wrongfully appointed. God says, I'm going to correct all that. When I get through here today, tomorrow, you're not going to have any more to complain about. I'm going to take away all of the complaints. God was removing temptations for the Israelites to complain again about his selection of leaders. Matthew 6, 13, there in the Lord's Prayer, it says, And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's what God was doing to Israel. He was delivering them. He was cutting out their excuse for complaining. When Moses went into the tabernacle the next day, Aaron's staff had not only grown buds, but blossoms and ripe olives. Then God said, show it to Israel. Then put Aaron's staff with the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. <coughs> Excuse me. And you know what that means today? It's still there. That promise is still there. The sons of Levi will be the priest. <coughs> Almond trees, folks, are the first ones to blossom in the spring and they're the first fruits of Israel. Messiah is the first fruit of mankind. Yeshua's body, his fleshly light, died, was buried, and raised from the grave as the first fruits of all of those who will die in the frequency of God. They, like Yeshua, will be raised to eternal life and be his priests and kings of his kingdom. Lesson. Folks, we're to die to self and be resurrected as the Spirit of Messiah on the earth. This is, as Ezekiel puts it, the dry bones rising. <clears throat> you should go home and read. I was going to read, but it's, it's long. Ezekiel chapter 37, the whole chapter. To me, that's one of the most exciting chapters 
in the entire Bible. Read all of Ezekiel chapter 37. The staff of Aaron is in the Ark of the Covenant along with a bowl of manna and both sets of the Ten Commandments, the ones that were broken and the other ones that, were, that he came back down with. They're there to this day. It's a sign to us that we should never think of dividing the house of God through rebellion with accusations or Lashon Harab. Numbers chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. The Lord said to Moses, Bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels that you may put their complaints away from me. Hmm, I don't think God likes complaints, do you? Lest they die. Thus did Moses, he did as God said, just as the Lord had commanded him, so he did. The closing chapter in this week's study shows us our responsibilities as priests and kings of God. Numbers chapter 18, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Aaron, You and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear the iniquity related to the sanctuary, and you and your sons with you shall bear the iniquity associated with your priesthood. Now what does that mean? That means that all that preaching that absolutely did nothing fell on deaf ears, somebody's going to bear the iniquity for that. If what people are preaching, listen to this preachers, if what people are preaching doesn't change lives, you better remodel your preaching because it has to change lives. What did Rabbi Paul say in 1 Corinthians six nineteen? Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Christ paid the price. He bought you, and now you are to be Him. <clears throat> like Him. As priests and kings in God's kingdom, it's our responsibility to take care of the place where God's Spirit tabernacles, which is our body. This means we're to protect our bodies, to watch what we think, what we eat, what we see and what we allow to be injected into it. Trust God and relieve the stress of the world. Be careful who we associate with. Why is that? God told the Israelites, don't mix with those other people. Don't marry them. Don't go to their houses and have Sunday dinner. Don't go to church with them on Sunday. Why? Because it'll rub off on you. We need to be listening to God and God alone. <clears throat> Do not pollute the house of God with your perverse things. Keep the place where God tabernacles holy. That's you. Don't live out of harmony with the principles of God and the life He gave us. Torah is the way to reconnect with God. That's the reason Satan has put it in people's minds that the Old Testament, the Torah, has been done away with. No, it has not. You're living a lie. You're getting over there in the New Testament and you're justifying homosexuality and immorality and all those other things. That's what's happened to America. We quit teaching the truth. We quit teaching the original, the Torah. If we believe in Yeshua and live His eternal principles now, we don't have to worry about whether we're saved or not. We have life eternal, and the only change we will see when Yeshua returns is that we will get more in-depth Torah teaching. I can't wait. Amen. Wait, I, I dig and dig and research and research to try to make a, I get the deepest thing that I can get as God will unveil it to me, and I can't wait to hear Christ talk. I can't wait to hear His teaching. I don't care if I'm sitting in the back of the room. I'll be back there taking notes. <laughs> Learn this. Through Yeshua, we are justified. By being obedient to the Word of God, we're changed into His image. And now, all of God's people receive this lesson by shouting, Amen.
And George? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Hallelujah. Praise God. 